To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Wa idha al-Jahim su'irat Wa idha al-Jannatu uzlifat Alimat nafsum ma ahdarat Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah A couple of things that, I, that slipped my mind that, I should have been, uh, that should have been mentioned in the previous session About the ayat that we've already covered uh, Number one, in the previous uh, Surah, we found an interesting word of the words that Allah uses for the people that you're running away from. He says, wa sahibatihi wa banihi, wa banihi. He doesn't say wa auladihi. He says banihi. Now, banin in a classical usage is specific to sons. It doesn't include daughters. It does not include daughters. Uh, for example, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Afa asfaqum rabbukum bil banina wa taqadha min al malaikati inata." Now, typically in Arabic. A plural, a jama' mudakkar salim, the masculine plural, is inclusive of the feminine. Except for some words where it's, you know, exclusively masculine. It's an, ex- it's an exclusive thing. So banin is one of those things. It's sons only. And this was used because on the day of resurrection, the, the audience is the kafir. And who does he love? He loves his sons. And that love of the sons is illustrated in his, uh, also in his, in his embarrassment over daughters that's coming out in this surah. So there's, there's a continuation of that. But the other thing that I alluded to but I didn't get to talk to you about was there are two pregnancies mentioned in the surah. That the ishar is mentioned, the 10-month-old pregnant she-camel is mentioned, and then the ma'udah is mentioned, the baby girl that's born and that's been buried alive. And you know, of these things, a decent human being would have value more for what? For a child, right? But look at how despicable these kuffar has, have become that of the things that would, you know, first Allah talked about things that would scare them. Then he talked about things that they would love the most and then they would lose love of it all of a sudden, right? And of those things, the first thing that he mentioned was al-ishar, not even their, their children, not even the daughter. And when it comes to the child, he's willing to bury it. When it comes to al-ishar, it's a source of pride, dignity, glorification. So it's this contrast in the messed up mentality of the kafir. It's looking deep into his psyche. The other thing that's happened here is the, the uh, Qur'an and the da'wah, the early da'wah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something that isn't just talking about what will happen after the world ends and after all of this, after we're gone. And it's not just talking about way, way back in the day, old generations. It's talking about problems of that society. So when, even though this is on the day of judgment, this, per, this child is being asked what crime she was killed for, when the audience, the kafir audience, the criminal audience hears this, they're not thinking about that time, they're thinking about right then and there. So the Qur'an starts tackling social evils of that society. And the other thing to mention here from a da'wah point of view is, this is an aspect of da'wah that gets overlooked, which is that the, that the messengers, all of them, they came and they pointed out the evils of that nation to them and told them that this deen is not just good for their akhirah, but it's good for them because they are oppressive or they're even wronging themselves by engaging in the things that they're doing. Right? So part of da'wah, for example, in our context is all of the problems that, you know, uh, and th- this is on the side note, but all of our problems that we consider are the problems of the Muslim community are actually American problems. Like if we have problem of the youth, there's an American problem of youth. Right? Our children are watching some things, that's an American problem. It's not an, a Muslim problem, it's a problem for everybody. Right? So it's a universal kind of thing. If, if we are against riba, well, this society is, is victimized by riba. There are vast majorities of people that have lost everything they own because of riba. And they're, they're living horrible lives. I would never, you know, a decade ago, maybe even five, six years ago, you would see commercials on television, like infomercials late at night about these children in, in Somalia and in these, these hungry parts of the world and we should send food to them, blah, 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 dollar a day. I see in commercial now about, you know, families living in Arkansas and living in New York City and feed the children program in America, for God's sake, subhanAllah. That's the point, we, this is what riba has done to this country, right? So, uh, so when, you, when you tackle an evil, it's not just us versus them kind of thing. Allah Azza wa speaks on behalf of this child, who is the child of a, obviously a mushrik or a kafir family, 
She's not a, you know, and, and the, this evil exists among them. This is not a Muslim problem. This is that society's problem. But he's tackling it for them. And he's, he's addressing it for them. And this is part of what gives Islam its universal appeal. You know, unlike any other group, when a group comes together and makes a call, then they typically make a call for their own rights. We deserve this. We deserve that. We need more liberties. We, may, we need more respect or, you know, our, our voice should count more, etc., etc. Us, 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 us. If you look at the da'wah of the Qur'an, first of all, it's about the akhirah. Fix, your, fix yourself. It's about you, not me. It's about you, right, first of all. And second of all, even the issues that are mentioned, there are no surahs dedicated to the oppression against the, the sahaba and how bad that is and how the kuffar need to stop. There's mention of it here and there. Even then, have sabr and just move on. The worst atrocities, the worst atrocities. You find, you know, uh, Yasir, Sayyidina Yasir radiallahu anhu and his family being killed, tortured and killed. And what are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu You know, he's telling them, Isbiru ya Yasir, just have sabr family of ya ahla Yasir, have uh, family of Yasir, have sabr. Right? Khabbab bin Arad comes to Rasulullah sallallahu with coal, you know, he's basically been barbecued. His skin has been peeled off, melted off of his back. He comes complaining and Rasulullah sallallahu says, you're rushing to it. There were people before who had much worse times. Why? Because there's a, there's a larger call. This is why even in the ayah, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat, it's not minan nas, it's lin nas. Right? You're the best of nations raised for people, not from people. Right? If you say you're the best nations from the people, I'm the, we're the best out of them. But if we're the best for them, what makes us the best is that we are concerned for them. Right? It's a completely different mentality. So that's actually even illustrated in Makkah and Da'wah. Allah speaks to the most vicious of the kuffar, but he speaks on behalf of the mazlum, the ones who've been killed, the ones who've been oppressed. So he speaks about the rights of the miskeen. Even in Makkah Quran, there's rights of the miskeen. They're the people who are being cheated in business. Waylul al-Mutaffifin is coming, right? These are social, economic problems that the moral, ethical problems these people have, family problems that these people have. These are people that nobody speaks on their behalf. No, there's no customer service department. You can't return something for a refund when you get cheated out of business, especially if you come from a weaker tribe. You better beat it or you're going to get killed asking for a refund, right? Allah speaks on their behalf. Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks on their behalf. And this is actually part of the power of the da'wah of Islam, that it, it, it stands by those who have been victimized by injustice. It stands for justice. Qumu lillah shuhada' bil fisq. Stand for the sake of Allah being witness to justice, right? Uh, uh, for the sake of justice. Anyhow, so that was one uh, slight comment. T uh, two things about the, uh, the two kinds of pregnancies and what the vicious nature of this, this demented kafir. And on the other hand, the idea that even social justices are being mentioned, not just things about the you know, metaphysics of the hereafter and the, and, and the previous nations, but even now, right now, these are evils that you need to tackle. Otherwise, you'll be in serious trouble then. Now the surah takes a shift. The rest of the, the ayat are a conclusion of the rest. And how do we know they're a conclusion? Here's a fa. The fa necessarily connects whatever statements are coming to the statements that came before. So that discourse that has just ended with alimat nafsum ma ahdarat, which is the conclusion of that entire passage. That entire first passage concludes in one statement, alimat nafsum ma ahdarat. Every person already knows very, very well whatever it has to present for itself. It knows it very well. And then as a result, now these are actions by the way, ma ahdarat is, is, is the actions. Now we're going to go from the world of actions into the world of beliefs. Because actions are rooted in what? In beliefs, right? And the Qur'an illustrates this over and over again. First he'll mention belief, then actions, then he'll mention actions and belief. Because there's a cycle of, of, of amal and iman, right? Of, of actions and deeds, a, actions and faith, actions and faith. What you believe will lead you to a certain kind of action. And when you take a certain kind of action, it'll fortify your belief in something. And then it'll lead you, lead you into a different kind of action. So there's a cycle between iman and amal. Right? So now some things about, you, you should know before we get into the next passage, is some things about the thought process of the kuffar. They thought certain things were bad omens. Like a daughter is a bad omen. It's a sign of bad, you know, uh, it's, it's misfortune for the family, etc., etc. This wasn't the only thing. They had weird superstitious kinds of beliefs in many things, including stars. And this is not just limited to them. Even now you have like astrology and all this kinds of stuff, right? And palm reading and these sorts of things. So they had an entire, you know, industry running out of this. And this is actually a world industry. Like of the criminal industries in the world, like, you know, drug trafficking and prostitution, et cetera, et cetera, there's also this. 
astrology. It's an actual industry. And unfortunately, nowadays, it's probably the most potent and most powerful in the Muslim world, where you go to palm readers, and they come and tell you your fortune, or they, you know, they, they look at the stars or whatever else. So you know, this is a common shirk practice. It's a, very, it's a satanic practice, really, that is common, unfortunately, in the Muslim world. But even here in the U.S., we, we talked about how like, these financial executives look at, go to the palm reader and stuff. Right? Now, anyway, the Quraysh, they had this thing about stars. You know, the stars, uh, they, they twinkle. So sometimes they look like they're brighter, then they're a little faded away, then they're brighter, then they're fading away. So there's like a, you know, uh, uh, an off and on kind of thing with stars. Right? And they would think that the stars are trying to tell us something when they do that. They're, they're talking to us. And then they would, they would shoot, see a shooting star like a meteor or something, right? In English expression, the shooting star. They would say this is a sign of something. So some of the people that are, you know, they don't have anything else to sell, so they say, I belong to a special group who has access to these shayateen who go into the heavens, and they find out what these stars are telling us. And this is actually a pretty serious thing about, uh, has to do with the safety of you and your family. Uh, in order to find out more, call this 800 number, only 1995, et cetera, per hour. You know, so they, basically it was a business. It was a business. The idea was, you come to us, we'll get you classified information that we get from a secure source, the shayateen, these devils, that we can talk to, and these are the kahin, the mind readers, right? We get this information from them, and that's how we deliver it to you. And so people would go to them when, you know, uh, the woman becomes pregnant, am I having a boy or a girl? Or should we attack that tribe or not? Or should I kill my cousin? Uh, am I gonna get killed for it, or am I gonna get away with it, et cetera, et cetera? They would go to advice for the, with these kahin, and then they would jumble, they would just, uh, uh, many narrations tell us they would mumble up words like hey, me, 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 like they're just nonsense, right? Make it seem like they're actually getting some connection, telepathic connection going on, and then all of a sudden, ah, I got it, and you need to do this or that or the other, right? So that's this was the game they would play. Now Allah Azza wa Jal swears by stars, stars, and stars understand in Mushrik culture, in that culture specifically, had a lot to do with these omens and superstitions and beliefs. And one of the allegations against the Messenger وسلم, was that he's again a kahin. He's a mind reader too. He gets this stuff from the stars. He gets this stuff from devils and shayateen that come from the stars and tell him this stuff, that's what he's doing. So now that you know that this, what Muhammad وسلم, is telling you is asking you to question your conscience. As opposed to the kahin who used to get paid for this, and then he would tell you most of the time what you want to hear. What, what has come right now in the surah, is that something the mushrik wants to hear? No, it's the exact opposite. So now Allah refers to the, goes to their apparent source of knowledge, which is these stars, and says, Fala, no, on the contrary. And this la here is not connected to uqsimu, it's connected to what came before. Based on all of this, not at all. Don't make these assumptions at all. And this la is basically, shut up all of you. Just be quiet. Listen to what's about to be said. Uqsimu bil khunnas. I swear by al khunnas. Khunnas is the plural of khanis. And khanis in Arabic is someone who's going on a path and all of a sudden takes a turn or hides behind a bush and you can't see them anymore. And then they're avoiding contact with you and then they're seen again and they're unseen again, right? So the star, they would say when a star has appeared, it's a sign for me. But by Allah calling it al khunnas he's saying they appear but they also disappear. So if you think that it's a power of theirs to appear, well, Allah controls their appearing and their disappearing. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ Allah swears by these, He's going to swear by these to, and when Allah swears by something, there's always a conclusion. What's called jawab al-qasam, right? So that jawab al-qasam is coming, inshaAllah ta'ala. Al-jawar al-kunnas, and there's no wa or fa in the middle, so it's a continuation of the previous. Al-jawar is, is comes from jara or jawran, to veer off the highway. So a star that goes off of its place, like a shooting star basically, okay? And al-kunnas, this is, uh, it comes from kinas, and kinas is the hiding place of a deer. Like a deer is running, running, running in the woods, and all of a sudden, where'd it go? It's almost like it disappeared, right? So the deer has a, a place inside the bushes where it becomes virtually invisible. So what this illustrates, a very beautiful analogy, is that the, the, the star that's shooting, all of a sudden, what happens to it? It disappears. Like it's a brief moment of movement, and then it disappears. Al-Jawar al kunnas These were the things that they associated their superstitions with. And Allah Azza wa Jal begins by swearing by them, illustrating His control over them. Illustrating His control over them. And also, what's interesting in the Qur'an, Islahi comments on this, and so does al-Shawkani, rahmahullah, that the, they believed that the jinn get them information from the stars. But we learn about al-Shihab al-Thaqib, for example, 
the, when the angel, when the jinn or shayateen try to get information, steal it from the malaika, what happens? Stars are shot against them. So what you think is the source of information is actually these devils getting a beating in the sky, in the heavens. Right? This is the, how secure that information is. So it's the exact opposite of what you believe. فَلَا أُقْسِبُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ Then he says, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا عَسْحَسْ He swears by another powerful thing. The night as it starts to darken and, and dwindle your, your vision. And this is used it's from Asma al dad Words that mean they're opposite. So عَسْحَسَ is used for the night when the evening is starting and also when the evening is ending. Because these are times when the vision is blurry. Okay, so in these hours when visions are blurry, meaning at that time you don't see the stars, where does your information go then? Allah swears by the time, He controls even how much you get to see these stars. He controls it by night. And then, and He swears by the morning, I swear by the morning as it gets to take a breath, as it gets to take a breath of relaxation. So the night is choking on the day, and the day gets to breathe. And when the day takes a breath, what happens to the stars? They're invisible to you. They're gone. They're completely gone. So this is actually Allah's control over what you get to see and what you don't get to see. When the stars are shooting or not shooting, when it's the daytime, you have no idea. So the information you're getting is, is all whim. It's all you know, uh, under Allah's control, but it's not what you're uh, uh, assuming you have is nothing. Now Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the right source of knowledge. إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ There is no doubt that this is truly the word of a noble messenger. Here, the noble messenger... Kareem, from, from Kirama, right? Karuma, Yakrumu, and Kareem. It refers to nobility and honor. And this is, this is a reference to Jibreel alayhi salam. Okay? There are a couple of things you should mention, uh, I should mention here that are very beautiful. First of all, Allah didn't say, Innahu la kalamu Rasulun Kareem. Kalam was not used. Kalam is a word for speech. Qawl is another word for speech. Okay? But kalam is used with Allah. In Surah Al Tawbah, we find, Hatta yasma'a kalam Allah. Until he gets to hear the kalam of. Allah. Now, kalam is literally that which is said from the source. Qawl is that which is uttered by the tongue. Now, you can have a qawl of that which is not your own kalam. When you have a kalam, it is your own. When you have a qawl, it could be somebody else's, you're just saying it. Okay? So, for example, qala, qala, Rasulullah He said that the Messenger of Allah said. So, when the one says it, is it his kalam? Whose kalam is it? It's the messenger's kalam. But it's this person's qawl. We're taking his word for what the messenger said. You understand? So it's verbatim. This person is verbatim delivering something. In other words, these aren't the words of Jibreel alayhi salam. They're the words of who? They're the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the word kalam isn't used. Because kalam is only used with Allah azza wa jal. Kalamullah. But this is the qawl of a, a messenger. Now, again, by calling, not just say, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ Jibril. He said, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ Rasul. First of all, understand why Rasul? Why not Jibril? Because he is delivering something. A messenger delivers something. What's he delivering? A message. A message in what? The word itself. So he's going to be very precise with his words. Why is he going to be precise with his words? Because unlike a shaitan, a devil, which the kahin relies on, which already everybody knows, the guy's a devil, so there's no nobility associated with it. His attribute, the first attribute you know about this messenger is what? Kareem. He's Kareem. He's noble. So it's part of his nobility that he will deliver this word, this speech in all honesty. This is the first thing about the source. Understand that in the previous surah, Allah spoke about the integrity of revelation. فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمًا مَرْفُوعَةٍ مُطَهَّرًا بِأَيْدِي سَفَرًا كِرَامٍ بَرَرًا That was the integrity of revelation. But that's only one part of risala. Risala is the revelation, it is the recipient of that revelation, and it is the, the means by which this revelation is delivered. So one of them has been fortified and defended in the previous surah, the revelation itself, the source. The suhufun mukarrama, that's been defended in the previous surah. Now Allah is just defending what? The means by which this revelation comes. The means by which it comes. And then in this surah, he will also defend the messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa when he says, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ He'll defend the, the messenger himself. So there are three things. The message, the messenger, and the delivery. Right? The previous surah defended the message. This surah defends the delivery. And then it defends the messenger himself. Alayhi salam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ The word Rasul is from the parable of Fa'ul, which is a mubalagha. It's a hyperbolized form in the Arabic language. Someone who delivers something and um, is basically a professional at delivering. 
who's always delivering, or he's constantly he's engaged in delivering, and delivering well at that. The quwwatin, he is in possession, this, this uh, deliverer, this messenger, is in possession of great might, great strength. Now the weakness of the shayateen was illustrated when the stars are shot against them, they have no defense, they have to run. They have to run. And they have to find hiding places to sit and try to listen. In Surah Al-Jinn, we used to sit in these places where we could try to get to hear something, right? And then we used to get shihab al-rasada thrown against us. But on the other hand here, first of all, he himself is extremely mighty. So nobody's going to try to steal something from him. The quwwatin. But then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, where is he getting this stuff from? Where is he? Inda dhil arshi makin, right by the arsh. The word arsh in Arabic means roof, arasha ya'rishu, to build a wooden roof in the olden times. Okay? And wood is a is an extremely expensive commodity in the desert, right? It's not like now, wooden, no, we could, why not concrete or why not rock? But compared in the society from which these words are coming, arshul bayt, the roof of a house. Makin is a very interesting word. And there, in, in Arabic language, the, the roots of words, they have interplay with all the derivatives of those words and they come together beautifully and very poetically and, and, and in, in a very picturesque way. Makana means to live somewhere. Makan is a house, it's a place of stay. Kaun is existence. The, the original kaun, to be, to, to, to be located or to exist. Now, makin is someone who lives somewhere permanently, but also makkana or tamkin in Arabic means to give somebody high status. And from ancient times to now, ownership of a home and ownership of having a place to live in and of itself is a symbol of what? Of status. It's a symbol of status. And uh, the higher your place is, you know, the high, high profile neighborhood we say nowadays, the higher your status is apparently in dunya, right? Allah speaks of this messenger, Jibreel alayhi salam, and he says, Dil arshi makin. Right, you know, inda dil arshi makin. Right by the possessor of the, the throne, he is situated. And he's got that high, high status. Two things, where he's situated and his status. Then he says, muta'in. He is fall obeyed, muta'. From tawr, another very interesting word in Arabic. The word ta'a means, one thing it means to celebrate, also means to volunteer for something. وَمَن تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ Allah says. Whoever volunteers and puts of their own goodwill, they want to fast an extra couple of days, or they want to stay after the obligatory days of Hajj are over, then it's good for him. Right? So these tatawwa' is used for voluntary, voluntary out of your own will, you, you do something. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions this attribute, muta' which is an ism maf'ul, an objective noun, for uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, illustrating that he is followed, but followed lovingly. Meaning the people that follow him, he's got this very tight-knit army of, of followers, of angels, that obey his every command, and it's basically... You know, you know in, in, in our expression, we say when somebody commands, like a general commands, and the soldier is a very you know, vehement follower of the general, he says, with pleasure, right? So when somebody follows with pleasure, the one who is followed with pleasure is called muta'ah. Muta so he's followed with pleasure, meaning he's followed with this tight-knit army. Why is this being told to us? When he delivers his message, there's also a security team. All of these followers that, that, that follow this entire... Now, in dunya terms, just understand this in dunya terms. You know when a, a highly classified document or a classified piece of information or, or technology or something like that is being delivered? What has to happen? Does anybody get to, any security person gets to take it, deliver it? No. You have to have high-ranking officials that have access to this thing and then they put it in a cart and secure it and then they have to have a team of security in layers around it, and this needs to be, these are people that you have to do background checks on, and you have to have certain level security clearance before you can go on this journey to, to deliver this package, and it comes from the highest, highest sources, this package, is highly classified, this even happens now, that's what's being told to us here, this is a highly classified piece of information, this, this revelation is coming from a very high source, and the one delivering it is the highest ranked, and he's got an army of security, muta'in, thamma amin. And there, muta'in thamma means he is, he is followed over there. Thamma in the Arabic language is two things. Number one is dharf makan. It is a, it's a, a, a kind of noun used to describe a place. So over there, even right by the arsh even, he has a huge following. The following of Jibreel alayhi salam. That's thamma. The other use of thamma is very interesting in that it's, it's mentioned right before an adjective 
to empower that adjective or to highlight that adjective over all other adjectives that have been mentioned. So one, from Thamma, we learn Allah is talking about the station of, of Jibreel alayhi salam. The other is, of all the adjectives that are mentioned for Jibreel alayhi salam, the one that's been highlighted the most is which one? Ameen. Okay? Muta'in thamma ameen. Especially, especially that he is trustworthy. Why is that the most important? You can have a security clearance, high level, high profile deliverer, but if that, that deliverer has bad intent, can he sell the source? Can he go to the wrong place? Can he have alternative agendas? So this person, what's the most important ingredient after all of these external security features? Is trustworthiness, right? So Allah mentioned thamma ameen, that he's incredibly trustworthy. So he delivers this message from the high heavens to this man, Muhammad sallallahu and he's the most trustworthy of this job, and is delivered in the most secure way. Now this is, these ayat just, deliver, just defending what? The delivery of the message. Those kiramim barara that were referred to in the previous surah. Now of them, the ones that are responsible to deliver in, in support of Jibreel alayhi salam when he brings the message down. وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ And your companion, this is talking, there's a shift now, all of a sudden. Allah is now talking to the kuffar. On the day of judgment, he will not be talking to them. بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ What crime was she killed for? وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ Right? Not al waidu. Su'ilat or su'ila, right? The, the killer is not being questioned, the, the killed is being questioned. But now Allah turns to the kuffar, which is the ling it's a language illustration that even now you have a chance. Allah is turning to you still, and He's giving you an opportunity. Before we turn to this ayah, just know that inshallah ta'ala, on your, on your own, bi'idhnillah, study Surah Al-Najm. Surah Al-Najm. Surah Al-Najm has explicit details of how, of another, of, of how Jibreel alayhi salam is came into contact with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how that delivery took place the first time. So this, that's basically even a tafsir of this part of the surah over here. Anyhow, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ And the one in your company is not insane at all. There are a couple of things, words here that deserve our attention. The first is the word sahib. Allah did not say وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ بِمَجْنُونَ Muhammad is not insane, right? وَمَا هَذَا الرَّسُولُ بِمَجْنُونَ He didn't say that either. وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ your company, your companion. Sahib in Arabic means two things. The one who accompanies you in place, in, in space, and also in time. This illustrates that he is lived among your midst. You know him, you know where he lives, you've been close to him, physically close to him. Also it means he's been among you for a long time. He's been in your company for a long period of time. And this is the two ways you get to know someone. One, you live close to them and you spend a lot of time with them. These are the two things, right? Now, if, for example, in the masjid, we know somebody. We spend some time with them, but we don't live close to them. Do we really know them? No, because they could be a completely different person when they go home. But if you live close, you're their neighbor, and you spend a lot of time with them, now you really know them. That, that's sahib. There's two, both things, time and space, closeness and space. So he's been among your midst for a very long time, so you already know very, very well that he's not insane, that he's not a mind reader, that he's not interested in any of these petty things, and the best possible attributes that you can come up with, you give to him. This is your sahib. So you know very well that he's not insane. وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ Now, the other thing about the word jinn, uh, what you know about that is, it's another uh, uh, um, a loaded word. Jannah in Arabic means to cover something up. Literally, to cover something up. And to climb over it. The jannah is called jannah because it covers the dirt with lush greenery. And it's a lush garden where you, it's one thing covering the other. Okay, so it's an overflowingly lush garden. Jinn, because he's, our eyes are covered from seeing them. Janin, the womb of the mother, because the baby is covered, is on the inside. Okay, Majnoon is two implications. One, whose intellect has been overshadowed or covered. His rationale, his sense of reasoning have, has been covered. So he can't make sense of things, they call him insane. That's one implication of Majnoon, it's an ism maf'ul. The other implication is someone who has been possessed by a jinn. And the two are connected. They would say a person, is, his intellect has been overshadowed by the possession of a jinn. They would combine the two things. So Allah says, وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ He is not possessed by a jinn. Also implies he's not getting his information from what? From jinn. These words are not inspired by, by a jinn, rather by the angel Jibreel alayhi salam, who delivers them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ And no doubt he, tr he saw him in the clearest part of the horizon. Al-ufuq is a corner, literally it means a corner. 
at five quarters, so the far horizon where the earth and the sky meet. From there, the clearest part, he saw Angel Jibreel alayhi salam. So this is describing his experience as a seen thing, as a seen thing. So he's not insane, he actually saw this happen. Now, again, keep in mind in the background, this is talking to people who take information from mind readers. And the mind readers say, I see things you can't see, right? Or they'll say, we get information from the unseen, but you have to pay us before we give it to you. We'll give it to you, but you have to pay us. Right? That's the idea. Allah Azza wa shows another contrast between these pathetic mind readers and these majnoon people and the noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَنِينَ He is not, the word dhanin is close to the word bakhil. You know what bakhil is? Cheap, right? Miserly. But dhanin is someone cheap in information. Like, you know, a chef who doesn't like to share his recipe. Or like, or, or like you know, Pepsi that one doesn't want to give their formula for the soda. Or something like that, right? These are dhaneen. When you hide information, a financial analyst, you'll call him and say, I need some financial advice. Okay, I'll give you two minutes. Then you got, a, you know, $100 an hour or something, right? Or an accountant. These are people that hold back information until they get what they want. He says, in terms of the unseen, even though it's seen for him, because he saw the angel, وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ He is not, when it comes, especially when it comes to the unseen, he's not being cheap with you. He's not holding it back, it back and saying, let me tell you something that's really going to benefit you after you pay me. He's giving this stuff off, away to you. He has no alternative agenda. Compare this to what you're calling him. All the people that call, that, that you are saying he's just like a kahin, they're all interested in some sort of agenda. They want something out of you. He's not like them. He's not banin. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَنِينَ وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And this is the final conclusion. And in the end, this is not the word of a cursed devil at all. مَا هُوَ بِي مَا and بِي together, not at all. This is not at all. This is the farthest thing from being the word of a cursed. Rajim from Rajim, you know, pelting. Rajim literally means marjum. That is the one that is so cursed and has such wrath of the people that whenever they see him, they do what? They throw things at him. Right? That's how much anger that he, this person deserves. This is Rajim. The word shaitan has two origins. In classical Arabic, there's a disagreement among the ulama about the origins of the word shaitan. I'll share both with you. In my opinion, actually, uh, I was talking to Sheikh Abdul Rauf Zaman about this, one of my heroes in the United States. Alhamdulillah, protect him and preserve him. He's the imam of a masjid in New Jersey, and he's just an authority in tafsir. He said, you know, when there's a word that can be interpreted from multiple roots, this is perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal's illustration of how much he owns this language. That we think of all these different possibilities and they all connect. And Allah, because he's the creator of language, picks a word that can go both ways and puts both in one word, subhanAllah. And this is one of the powers of Allah's you know, control over language. Anyhow, because it's his creation. Shatana means to be far away from the truth. That's one meaning of shaitan. The one who is extremely far from the truth, from mubalagha. Okay, shaitan. Fay'al, that pattern. On the other hand, it could be from shata. Shata means to be engulfed in flames. Engulfed in flames of rage, literally. So the one who's extremely angry or extremely frustrated, engulfed, burnt up, scorched, literally. So shaitan from, uh, from fa'lan then, the mubalagha pattern. What that would illustrate on the one hand is shaitan is calling to something that is the farthest from the truth. That's number one. Number two, that his, uh, his humiliation before Adam alayhi salam has burned him so much, all the, all the things he does until now are still as a result of him being scorched since then. He's, he's burnt about it still. You know, we use that expression in English even nowadays. You're still burnt about that, right? So that's why he's called shaitan. So this is not the word of a cursed shaitan. فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Then where are you headed? Where are all of you going? This, by the way, to me, is the center of the surah. This is the heart of this whole surah. The heart of this surah is just, just a question. You know, the previous two surahs were the kuffar asking questions. They were asking, even in Naba, they were asking questions, right? They were, they were posing, you know, these, these um, casual kinds of statements about the akhirah. And now Allah has just one question. فَأَيْنَ تَذَبُونَ Then after knowing all of this, where are you going? Where are you headed? Where, what are you running off to? You're, you, have two, you have this world of corrupt knowledge and you have this world of the most, or this source of the most authentic, secure, noble, <coughs> priceless information that will save you from ultimate destruction. But where are you headed? فَأَيْنَ تَذَبُونَ and then in the end, why is it that you don't go this way or the other? In huwa illa dhikru lil alameen. By the way, this ayna tadhabun, you, you go this way or that way, is again a tafsir of what came before, amma man istaghna, the one who doesn't care, goes wherever he wants. 
He, does, he feels he's free of need. That was in the previous surah. Now, where are you people headed? Then he says, In huwa illa dhikru lil alameen. In the previous surah, he said, Kalla innaha tadhkira. No, 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 this is nothing but a powerful reminder. Now he says, This is nothing but a reminder. In huwa illa, this is nothing but a, rem- a powerful reminder. Dhikrun lil alameen. For the worlds. This is a reminder for the worlds. What this illustrates, by the way, is two things. You can go off, there are other people that will take it. Alameen. It's not just li Quraysh. Right? So it's, it doesn't need you. The message doesn't need you. In the previous surah, the message was exalted above the arrogance of the Quraysh. Now they're being told, you, don't, you, you want to take it or not, that's your problem. This is a reminder for all of the worlds, all of the nations of the world. And this is not the samawat wal ard. Al alameen is referred for, for dhul aql, basically, the, peop- the creatures of intellect, human beings, jinn, and angels. Okay? They're included in al alameen, but not like uh, mountains and trees and those kinds of things. So in the Quran, whenever alameen is used, you will find it's for nations. So nations of the world, nations of the jinn, nations of the angels. This is a reminder for all of these creatures, specifically the human being primarily and then the jinn. So dhikrul lil alameen. Li man sha'a min kuman yastaqeem. This li is a badal of the li in the previous ayah. The way we understand that in, in Arabic would be in huwa dhikrul lil alameen, in huwa dhikrul li man sha'a min kuman yastaqeem. It's connected together. This is nothing but a reminder for the one among you who has the intent, who wants to, sha'a, like we say insha'Allah. Whoever wants among you to be upright, to be straight. And there's a beautiful imagery in this ayah that I want to share with you. The word istiqama, like Sirat al Mustaqim, originates from the word qama yaqumu, to stand. Yastaqim, the one who wants to stand up straight. Allah says, This is a reminder for the one who wants to stand up straight. And you know when we recite this reminder? When we stand up straight in salah, subhanAllah. So there's an, even an imagery and alluding to the salah in the language of the ayat, right? Anyhow, so, liman sha'a min kuman yastaqeem, whoever makes the intent from among you that he, he may set himself straight. And by the way, istiqama is to stand up vertically. Vertically, okay? To stand up vertically. Uh, to, to not lie down, but to stand up from yastaqeem. This is why salat al mustaqim is not a straight path like this, left to right or forward to backward, it's actually headed upwards. It's headed upwards. So the one who walks this path is elevated in darajat because it's headed upwards, away from dunya towards the akhirah. Right? That's the, the, even the imagery in the Fatiha. So, liman sha'a min kuman yastaqeem. In the previous surah, it was a similar offer. Faman sha'a dhakara. Whoever wants, he can make mention. So, this again, complementing what has already been illustrated in even more powerful language here. Now, the, some things about the word mashia that is very, very beautiful, and that will help us conclude this surah, inshaAllah. The word sha'a comes from the word shay'un. And you must have heard the word shay'un before. What does shay'un mean? A thing, an object, a thing. Okay? So what does sha'a, to want, to intend, have to do with a thing? Another word for intent in Arabic is arada. Arada yuridu iradatan. Right? Innama amruhu idha arada shay'an an yaqula lahu kun fayakun. Right? So the, what's the difference between arada and sha'a? First of all, this is one thing to understand. Sha'a comes from shay, which means a concrete intention. Just like, you know, a shay is something, uh, uh, it's not abstract, it's actually physical. When your plans are so solid, your plans are there, that you are going to do this, and it's as concrete as a shay itself, a thing itself. Like in, in physical form, that's a strong intent. Irada, uh, uh, iradatun can be in your head, but never manifest. And you don't even plan to execute it. So it's the kind of person that says, yeah, I should become better. I plan to. I plan to start praying, but they never really start praying. Or I, I should be studying. I've made the intention that I'm going to work out. Or I made the intention that I'm going to start studying a little bit more. And that intention is there, and after 10 years, you see, you have the intention still. Yeah, yeah, I still got the intention. It's stored pretty well. That may be irada, but it's not what? Mashia. It's not concrete. So Allah speaks to the person here who's made the concrete intention. Maybe the thought crossed their mind. Some irada was there, but it didn't manifest. But the people who will be able to set themselves straight, who will get reminder from this Qur'an? The one who truly wants, has mashia. They've made that intent, that, that concrete intent, coming from shay. Okay? لِمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْ كُمَنْ يَسْتَقِيمُ But even in the end, your mashia, your concrete intent is dependent. No matter how strongly we, we think our intention is, it is not the be-all, end-all. Allah says, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ What concrete intentions are you going to make on your own anyway? إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah. Except what Allah wants. What concrete intentions Allah has made for you, right? So you make that intent, and this is actually part of the summary. One of the summaries of the Quran is Allah Azza wa Jal 
illustrates a balance between divine will and human effort. The whole Quran is a balance between divine will and human effort. Who was, whose effort was mentioned first? In this, لِمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يَسْتَقِيمْ وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا يَنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ Whose effort, whose intention was mentioned first? Ours. You do your part. You make the intention. You make it concrete. You start taking the first step. Allah will make the next thousand steps easy for you. You think you're going to do it on your own, you will fail. But you think Allah will do everything for you, you will fail. You have to take the first step and then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's this balance between what we owe to Allah and what Allah's help, when Allah's help will come. When you don't understand this balance, you get two imbalances. On the one hand, someone thinks they can do everything on their own. They're independent. Istighna. On the other hand, you have the person who doesn't do anything and says what? Allah will do it for me. Whenever Allah wants, I'll become good. You know, Allah wanted it for you, so it happened. He didn't want it for me, so it didn't happen. No, no, no. You didn't want it, so Allah didn't want it for you. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا إِنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ The Lord, the Rabb of all of the worlds. And this, this word in the end, the word rububiyyah in the Qur'an is, is associated constantly, constantly with hidayah, with guidance. So what are you going to want that your Lord doesn't want for you? And this in, in, in the end is the guidance. Just finally, inshallah, concluding how we started the surah and how it concludes. The surah begins with some of the most enormous manifestations of divine will. Right? It is by divine will that that's mountains will start just floating around, just casually walking around. And that the sun will be wrapped up. And that the stars will collapse. And they'll lose their texture. And that the sky will be peeled like the skin of a camel. All of those things are a manifestation of divine will. So what is our will compared, and the will of the kafir even? What intents are you going to make compared to the will of Allah? إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ His lordship over the worlds is illustrated in the beginning of the surah. Another beautiful comparison here, the beginning says of what's going to happen on this world, in this world. And the end, just after you've heard all of this, it just ends with a simple question, أَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you headed? After hearing all of this, where, what's your conclusion? Where are you headed? So Islam wants from a person, what, what it demands is that we don't just live in the world of abstract ideas where we hear interesting philosophical concepts, but we never actually think about them, implementing them in our life. Islam is demanding action. If you find something, you find the truth in it, you don't just say, oh, that's interesting. And then just walk away. No, no, no. Where are you headed? Where are you going? This is something that's supposed to demand a change from you. So it, it necessarily calls people from thought to action. There's that other balance. We talked about divine will and human, human effort. The other balance is between thought and action. So the beginning is thought, and now the conclusion, conclusion is action. Subhanallah. May Allah give us a correct understanding, a better understanding of His book. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.